Good evening. My name is Barb Coker. Our presider today is Father John Durbin. Our mass intention for this evening is the people of the parish. A very special welcome to those of you who have joined us for mass today. If you are joining us via YouTube, please know we look forward to the day that we can all be together again in this space. For those of us, those of you worshiping with us in person today, we ask that you wear your mask over your nose and mouth for the entire duration of the mass. In addition, please wait in the pews until an usher dismisses you for communion. Thanks for these efforts, which will prayerfully keep you, your family, and your fellow parishioners safe. St. Andrew Preschool children have been successfully back in session since September. The preschool is holding an all-aboard fundraising campaign during the month of October in lieu of the annual Basket Bunko fundraiser. Donations can be made online or mailed to the preschool. See the website for details. If you are not receiving our regular electronic communications, please call the parish office during business hours to be added to our list. And please remember to silence all electronic devices. Good evening. This is a little surreal for me. <laughs> Before we begin, we'd like to take a moment to welcome visitors or newly registered members to the parish. Would you please stand and tell us where you're from? Yes, ma'am. Oh, Mary, it's you. I didn't recognize with the uh, thing. Nice to see you. We, uh, her husband and I worked together at the parish for many years. Mary, this is Mary Egan from Chapel Hill. Nice to have you here. Any special occasions to note? Birthdays, anniversaries, new arrivals? Yes. Our son-in-law is back home and will be watching this recording with our daughter after the for 16 months. 16 months back. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> Greg? Yeah, uh, one of my courses, Tim Mannix, wanted me to wish his lovely wife a happy 80th birthday this morning. Happy birthday. That's Kathy, right? Yes. I invite you to stand and say hello to those who are around you.
Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Let us pause for a moment and prepare ourselves by calling to mind our sins. You are the image of God. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. You are the Word who became flesh. Christ, have mercy. Christ, Christ have, have mercy. You intercede for us at the Father's right hand. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. us pray. Almighty ever-living God, grant that we may conform our will to yours and serve you in sincerity of heart. Through Christ our Lord. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. Thus says the Lord to his anointed Cyrus, whose right hand I grasp, subduing nations before him and making kings run in his service, opening doors before him and leaving the gates unbarred. For the sake of Jacob, my servant of Israel, my chosen one, I have called you by your name, giving you a title, though you knew me not. I am the Lord, and there is no other. There is no God besides me. It is I who arm you, though you know me not, so that toward the rising and the setting of the sun, people may know that there is none besides me. I am the Lord. There is no other. The word of the Lord.
Lord bless his name. salvation day after day tell his glory among all the lands among all peoples his wondrous deeds give to the Lord you family of nations give the Lord glory and praise Lord, the glory to his name. Worship the Lord in holy attire, tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord is king. He governs his people with equity. A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Thessalonians. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. We give thanks to God always for all of you, remembering you in our prayers, unceasingly calling to mind your work of faith and labor of love and endurance in hope of our Lord Jesus Christ before our God and Father, knowing, brothers and sisters loved by God, how you were chosen. For our gospel, did not come to you in word alone, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with much conviction. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. The Pharisees went off and plotted how they might entrap Jesus in speech. They sent their disciples to him with the Herodians saying, Teacher, we know that you are a truthful man and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. And you are not concerned with anyone's opinion for you do not regard a person's status. 
Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it lawful to pay the census tax to Caesar or not? Knowing their malice, Jesus said, Why are you testing me, you hypocrites? Show me the coin that pays the census tax. Then they handed him the Roman coin. He said to them, Whose image is this and whose inscription? They replied, Caesar's. At that he said to them, Then repay to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, and to God what belongs to God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. This was an actual letter addressed to the Internal Revenue Service. Dear IRS, my conscience has been bothering me. Here is $1,000 which I owe in back taxes. A postscript at the bottom of the page read, if my conscience continues to bother me, I'll send you the rest. <laughs> in December of 1985, United States Congressman Delbert Lotta summarized the progress that was being made on simplifying the tax code. He held up I hold in my hand 1,379 pages of tax simplification. Mark Twain famously said, while figures don't lie, liars do figure. <laughs> tax issues have been around as long as there have been governments. So we jump right into the gospel this evening with Jesus and taxes. But some background is important to understand the non-answer that Jesus actually makes to his questioners. When Jesus asked the Pharisees whose image is on this coin and whose inscription, the Greek word translated image is icon, from which, of course, we get the English word icon. The word image takes us all the way back to the book of Genesis, where we are told that we are made in the image and likeness of God. So we are stamped, in a sense, as a coin is stamped with an image. So if we give back to the emperor the coin that belongs to him because it has his image on it, then it follows logically by the scriptures that we would give back to God ourselves, for we have his image stamped upon us. So Jesus here is once again refusing to answer with a win-lose game of the Pharisees, but he is backing the whole thing up and changing the discussion with a very profound truth. We owe the one who made us our very lives, which means everything that we are, everything we do, and everything we have. Which brings me to the meat of the matter of my homily this evening, stewardship. Stewardship is actually about us becoming listeners and deep lovers. Becoming as fully human as we can be, which means fully as much as godlike as we can be. We are stamped, we are icons, images of Jesus as his disciples. Jesus was a listener. He listened to the pain and the sorrow of humanity, and he was a lover, a lover of all, especially those who suffered in any way. When we die, it has been suggested that God will ask two things of us. Were you a good listener, and were you a good lover? To be a person who lives in the spirit of God is to be a listener and a lover, to be a steward, of all that we've been given is to walk the path of joy, which is a not much traveled road these days. Everywhere, everybody's stressed out, overtired, grumpy, and angry, even in the church. Maybe we should call ourselves the grumpy children of God. But even in the midst of pandemic, we have it better than anybody else in the entire world. Why are we not, therefore, the most thankful and happy people in the world? All surveys of countries and their happiness, Americans aren't anywhere near the top. Most of them are places that we would consider economically deprived. 
What do we really have to complain about? We are not at war in our native land. Despite the economic downturn, most of us are still doing okay. Some are even doing better than okay. We sleep safely in our beds at night with heat or air conditioning as we need. Most of us think nothing about when our next meal will be coming. In fact, most of us are more likely to be pondering how we could lose a few pounds. If we are without a job, if we are struggling with an addiction or a difficult diagnosis, then we do have something to worry and complain about. But even then, even then, we have the presence of our loving God with us at all times. So what do we have to complain about? Too often, we act like the guy who got all A's but flunked life. If we are stewards with what we have been given, we have set out on a road that leads to joy. Because stewardship leads us to a life of order and balance, and that leads to gratitude. It gets our priorities and values straight. The phrase of an old song came from a preacher that Nat King Cole heard as a child, straighten up and fly right. Stewardship gives us an, an answer to the four most fundamental questions in life. Who am I? Where am I going? How do I get there? And where are the cookies? Okay, I lied. There are only three fundamental questions, but I just wanted to know if you were listening. But the cookie question is important, especially if they're chocolate chip. Stewardship tells us who we are which then gives direction to our lives and helps us to arrive at the end of our days in a place of eternal bliss. We do that with how we deal with our time, talent, and treasure. The fourth T, actually, of stewardship is transcendence because it grounds our lives in the God in whose image we have been stamped. When we know whose we are and where we're going, we're not seduced by the detours of money, sex, stuff, and power. We don't lose our way when we know whose image, in whose image we are made. And most of all, we become automatically grateful because we realize the fact that we are alive and breathing is already more gift than we could have ever asked for or even imagined. Unfortunately, many people in our culture have lost their way because life is more about the three A's, affluence, appearance, and achievement. These aren't necessarily bad, but they're not a life. And they're not worthy of being the only emphasis for a life. Who we are as stewards then influences who we are as a parish community. If we want to be a good parish, we have to be good stewards. A live parish is made up of tithers. It reaches out to others. It makes a difference in the local community. A dead parish has tippers, not tithers. And it's about fossilization, taking care of itself. It's usually dead quiet. Some parishes should simply be given a decent funeral and then let them move on. American values are also about the three C's, consumption, confrontation, and control. Read the news. We live in an affluenza society that wants more and more and more, and it's an in-your-face culture that is worried about, what if I get cheated out of my rights, my stuff, my dues? And then we want control over how life is going to unfold. For many people, that's the big problem with this pandemic. We have no control. For many people in our culture, they are what they have, which really is the most pathetic type of person imaginable. Other American values are the three Ps, power, processions, and prestige. And every one of us breathes this same air. We all struggle with these issues. We want to be on top. We want to have power. We want to have the latest and the most fashionable and stylish. We want to be looked up to and admired and often think that we will be if we live at the right address, drive the right car, and wear the right clothes. Well, how in the world does an, wearing an alligator or a polo player on our clothes make us special or better? 
Can we get any more shallow than that? These externals don't mean anything at all to God. We had a crusty old Jesuit who gave us the priest retreat a number of years ago, and I'll never forget him. He was a real character. He chain smoked the entire time he spoke. His hair hadn't seen a comb in days. He looked like an unmade bed. His shirt was always tucked out. He was kind of heavy. He sat there in the front of the room, and he said to all of us priests, when God sees you, he sees you bare naked. Egad, poor God. While the gospel calls us to a life of simplicity, we are a nation who are about having, and millions of our brothers and sisters are have-nots, and we still sleep pretty well at night. When I moved here two and a half years ago, I gave half of my clothes away, and I felt pretty good about it. Well, I still haven't worn some of those things in my closet more than once in this past year. I need to clean it out again. Sometimes I think stuff just multiplies in there in the dead of night. The image issue is a significant reality because we live on images. And tell me who God is for you, and then you can tell me your image of yourself. Because what our image of God and ourselves is determines who we are and then what we do. And whatever controls our imagination and our images then controls our actions and therefore our culture. If we think we don't have enough, then we're going to constantly be pursuing more and more and more. But if we recognize that we are the beloved ones of God, that we are created by God, sustained by God, we have everything because of God, then we know who we are, whose we are, and then there's a contentment and a happiness in life, regardless of our external circumstances at any given moment. It's true, this pandemic is not the most fun time of our lives. But does it have to rob us of our happiness? Yes, if we have lost somebody we love, we mourn, and we have the right to grieve. But what we call untimely deaths happen all the time, and we still have to move on with life. If we believe that those who die go home to a loving God, which is what we say we believe, then even death for us is not a bad thing. But the problem goes back to our imaging. What shapes our images? The media. I saw this in a paper, I saw it twice, so it has to be true, right? By age 50, the average, the average American has watched nine to 11 years of television. That's 20% of a life. But what did a person see in those 9 to 11 years of watching TV? Images which tell us constantly you don't have enough, you need this to be cool, you need this to be popular, you need this to make yourself happy, which leads to all those behaviors which exist to shape and mold us into consumers who buy, buy, buy. What we need and what stewardship provides is a radical change of images. And this is a conversion. It's a change of heart and mind. I had a conversation a couple of years ago with a guy who was 49 years old at the time. He said he was making over a quarter million dollars a year. And he said to me, something happened to me a couple months ago. I suddenly realized that it is not my wife, my four kids, not my anything. If one of our children died, my wife and I would weep. But the child was given to us in trust. The child belongs to God and goes back to God. And he says, for the first time in my life, I feel free. I'm now grateful for everything I have. The man had changed his images which he said then demanded a change in his behavior. And he said he finally began to tithe. Unfortunately, I was leaving the parish at the time. 
I think this is a great part of the difficulty in preaching about stewardship. We have to change our images, and then we'll change our behaviors. Right now, folks, we're running about 11% behind last year in our giving. This is not sustainable. We're also about $25,000 behind our budget. We have to decide whether God and this parish is important to us or not. Stewardship is really not a money problem. It's a faith problem. It's a gratitude problem. If we believe that God is the source of all that we have and own, then we want to share it. We want to give back. We're grateful and eager to share. But if we believe that we got what we got because we're smarter and more talented than the rest, then we don't believe at all what the gospel teaches. We're clueless about life as disciples. I give you four final notes about stewardship, rendering to God what belongs to God. First, stewardship is to receive God's gifts with gratitude. That's the first thing. We walked in here this evening. Millions of people can't even do that. We take it for granted. We can vote, and we should. We have a moral obligation to do so. We have education. We have books. We have the freedom to worship. Millions of people don't have any of these things. Are we grateful for this? Are we grateful for all that we've been given? The sense of gratitude is the only real source for joy. If we recognize everything is gift, then there is joy because we have so much. And then where there are stewards, there is joy. And we can never catch up to giving to God. I heard a speaker once say, as fast as we shovel back to God, God shovels faster and with a bigger shovel back to us. Second, a steward cherishes God's gifts responsibly. Do we cherish, nourish, and develop what we have been given? Not just money, but all of our gifts. If not, then we are wasting our gifts. For example, with TV, nine to 11 years of life, by the time we're 50, that's wasting a lot of time. And now add on to that Facebook, Twitter, and everything else that just sucks time right out of our lives. If we just dropped one of those activities, we'd have plenty of time to pray, connect with God, and remind ourselves in whose image we are made. But this requires discipline. Everything in life that's worthwhile requires discipline. It takes discipline to take the first 10% of our money and give it away before we get the urge to spend it on ourselves. Third, a steward shares what God has given generously and justly. We realize that the extra wealth we have is for others, not for more and more goodies for ourselves. When we eat nothing, and we are perpetually, when, when some eat nothing, and we are perpetually too fat, there's something wrong with the picture. And we should take a look at our fund spending and our tithing. If our fund spending's way more than our tithing, we need some adjustments. Fourth, a steward returns to the Lord with abundance. We live life and we live it to the full. That's stewardship. It's a fullness of life. We enjoy the gifts of God and we realize how many there are. The sun and the moon and the stars, the rain and the grass and the trees and the birds and friends and food and wine and good coffee and fall days and homilies that end. What? Who put that in there? And in conclusion, I take the hint, a wonderful little poem by Antonio Machado on a dialogue between the wind and a garden. The wind is the Holy Spirit, the garden is us. And it ends with this wonderful little reflection, stewardship question. The wind, one brilliant day, called to my soul with an aroma of jasmine. In return for this jasmine odor, I'd like the color of your roses. I have no roses. I have no flowers left in my garden. All are dead. Then I'll take the waters of the fountains and the yellow leaves and the dried up petals. The wind left. 
I wept. I said to my soul, what have you done with the garden entrusted to you? Amen. I believe in one God, the Father of the Lord, maker of the earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God and God, life and life, true God and true God, begotten and not made, consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation. By the Holy Spirit, who was incarnate with the Virgin Mary, who became man. For our sake, he was crucified in the conscious power. He suffered the death of his Mary, and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge us with the name of the dead, and his kingdom will have our way. I believe in the Holy Spirit. The Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is the Lord and glorified, who has spoken through the cross. I believe in one holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. I confess my baptism for the forgiveness of sin, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the Lord to come. Amen. Now let us offer our petitions. For the church, that we might respond to the call to build a community dedicated to inclusion, healing, and justice, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all those who share in the ministry of this parish community, may we bring compassion and understanding to all those in need, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For our elected leaders, that they may be inspired by the hope found in peace and work to end violence in all its forms, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For our upcoming election, that we will exercise our moral responsibility to vote in unity and peace, we pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord, hear hear our prayer. prayer. For those struggling with addiction and mental health conditions, May they be set free from captivity and helped to find true freedom, we pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord, hear our prayer. prayer. For the sick, including President and Mrs. Trump and all their associates, Michael Bebelheimer, Dorothy Wilson, Bob Camia, Dan Camia, Dave Lindhart, Isla Grace Christian, Mary Ann Trotta, Wish Olson, Herman Donnell, Ella Maluska, James Burns, Doug Smith, and all those affected by the coronavirus, we pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord, hear hear our our prayers. prayers. For the prayers in our Book of Intentions, for those who have asked for our prayers and for the prayers of all here, we pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord, hear hear our our prayer. prayer. And for the people of the parish for whom this Mass is offered, and for all who have died, including Rodney Atwood, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Loving God, you have given us infinitely more than we could ask for or even imagine. Hear our prayers through Jesus Christ our Lord.
pray, sisters and brothers, that this, our sacrifice, may become acceptable to God, our loving Father. Grant us, O Lord, a sincere respect for your gifts, that through the purifying action of grace we may be cleansed by the mysteries we serve. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And Lift up your hearts. Lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is, right it is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation always and everywhere, to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God. For in you we live and move and have our being. And while in this body we not only experience the daily effects of your care, even now we possess the pledge of life eternal. And having received the first fruits of the Spirit through whom you raised up Jesus from the dead, we hope for an everlasting share in the Paschal mystery. And so with angels and saints we sing the hymn of your glory, as without end we acclaim. You are indeed holy, O Lord, the fountain of all holiness. Make holy, therefore, these gifts, we pray, by sending down your Spirit upon them like the dewfall, so that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the time he was betrayed and entered willingly into his passion, he took bread and, giving thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it. This is my body which will be given up for you. <clears throat> In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and once more giving thanks, gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for the many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith when we Therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Lord, the bread of life and the chalice of salvation, giving thanks that you have held us worthy to be in your presence and minister to you. Humbly we pray that, partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. Remember your church spread throughout the world and bring us to the fullness of charity. Together with Francis, our Pope, Luis Raphael, our Bishop, all clergy, religious, and all who seek you with sincere hearts. Remember also our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection and all who have died in your mercy. Welcome them into the light of your face. Have mercy on us all, that with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, Joseph, her spouse, the apostles, Andrew, and all the saints who have pleased you throughout the ages, we may merit to be co-heirs to eternal life and may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him, with him, and in him, 
God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Deliver us, Lord, from every evil. Grant us peace in our day. In your mercy, keep us free from sin. Protect us from all anxiety as we wait in joyful hope for the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your friends, I leave you peace. Peace is my gift to you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church. Grant to us the peace, the unity of your kingdom, where you live forever and ever. Amen. May the peace of the Lord be with you always. God, who takes away the sin of the world, how blessed are those called to share at the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. Let us pray. Grant, O Lord, that benefiting from participation in these heavenly things, we may be helped by what you give in the present age and prepared for the gifts that are eternal. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. With may Almighty God bless you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace, glorifying the Lord by your life. Thanks be to God.